I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A, uh, and I'm not uh, going to talk, if you will, for most of the time that I've been allotted. But what I do want to do is go quickly through a few slides. And through those slides, raise questions in a very critical way, if you will, of the ways in which Latino advocates in particular use those numbers. Because I think oftentimes the numbers, and you've all heard about the increase of the Latino population, etc., misrepresent oftentimes what in fact is taking place on the ground. But let me begin by talking about this period of time and how it's historically distinctive. The migration surges from Mexico of the 19, early 1900s responded to conditions in Mexico itself. One was the Mexican Revolution and all of its repercussions. Related to that would be a very brutal, bloody confrontation between the Mexican federal government and the Catholic Church between 1926 and 1929. This is when my family came. My grandfather on my mother's side was a fanatic Catholic. Uh, four of his family members had been killed during that conflict, and that's why he came uh, and brought along my mom and so forth uh, with him. And um, uh, he and many others came from that particular time but also from a particular place. And this is one of the most distinctive things about the migratory flow of the 1980s, that surge, because it incorporated the non-traditional sending areas of Mexico. Uh, and the imaginary of Mexico, uh, the mariachis and all of you know, the guys with the charro outfits and so on, that's reflective of a particular region of Mexico. The surge that begins in the 1980s incorporates not only central Mexico, Jalisco, Guanajuato, Michoacan, the traditional sending states, but increasingly other states. And if you want, we'll talk about why. But the important thing, it's Oaxaca, a very indigenous-based area, and it brings in people who don't even speak Spanish very well. Uh, I'm from Madera. And Madera County was the first county to hire a Mixteco speaking person in order to translate from Mixteco to Spanish so that the kids could participate in the bilingual program. All right. uh, it, it included Veracruz, Chiapas, and the Yucatan. There are 6,000 Mayan speaking Indian uh, origin people in Novato and San Rafael in Marin County, mainly working uh, for the people who uh, have a much higher income, let us say, uh, in Marin County. Um, so the 1980s is distinctive because you see a dramatic reduction in the number of people coming from the traditional sending areas in comparison to the increase of people from the more southern parts uh, of Mexico and the like, and um, again, I don't want to get into a lot of numbers, but I invite your questions to discuss that particular distinctive moment. It's also a moment in which uh, a crisis develops in Mexico. It's a political and economic crisis. It has to do with the oil uh, prices crashing um, around 1980 and so on. And the dominant party of Mexico that had been in power since 1929 receives a tremendous jolt. Part of that jolt was the disconnection, the fraying of the connection, if you want to put it that way in a, in a more uh, what, charitable way, between the dominant party and the Mexican population. The political culture of Mexico, characterized by authoritarianism, characterized by rampant political corruption, had frayed that relationship and now it basically broke apart. And what we see is a downward spiral, spiral, pardon me, from the 1980s into the 1990s of the power and the, if you want, the authority, credibility of that dominant regime. 
So that political culture in the minds of many of the people who are coming from Mexico in the 1980s is not the political culture of the people who came in the 20s and the 1940s and 50s. And again, if you like, we can d discuss that particular aspect uh, of the process. A third element that's very important for us to consider is the maturation of the Mexican-American generation of the 1960s and 70s, the period of the civil rights activism, the period of the civil rights struggle uh, in various parts of the United States, most dramatically in the South, obviously, eyes on the prize, etc., but of course here in California as well. Uh, certain iconic figures arise, Cesar Chavez among them, but many others as well. And throughout the valley, there will be skirmishes, sometimes battles, uh, over the question of civil rights. My first job was at Fresno State, and I remember the bombing of the business school computer. I had nothing to do with it, wink, wink, uh, and so on. Uh, the establishment of Latino studies programs, Mexican-American studies programs, La Raza, whatever term you want to use, throughout the state, and it started at the UCs, went down to the CSUs, went down to the community colleges, and virtually all of the community colleges that uh, exist in areas where there is uh, a concentration of minority populations, particularly Latinos, has some kind of form of a Lita Latino studies program. It can be um, what uh, uh, an actual program with its own faculty or faculty who teach courses related, in this case, to Latinos, or whether it's African Americans, or Asian Americans, or Asians, as the case happens to be. The maturation of that population is important, because one of the ironies of the 1980s and 1990s is that many Mexican Americans have job opportunities expanded due to the increasing presence of immigrants, whether it's in social services, health services, the Department of Motor Vehicles that need Spanish-speaking people, et cetera, et cetera, not to mention uh, college counselors, teachers, et cetera, that become uh, evening instructors in some cases, in some cases become full-time faculty, as the case happens to be. In this regard, the maturation of that generation of the 60s and the 70s will then merge with the demands implicit or explicit of that surge that comes in from Mexico beginning in the 1980s. Another contextual element that's important is a shift in the two major parties in the United States. The Democratic Leadership Council arises out of the debris, if you will, of what happens in 1980 and 1984, particularly the 1984 landslide victory of Ronald Reagan. Uh, in which the DLC takes over, in a manner of speaking, the leadership of the Democratic Party, and the party moves even further away from its liberal roots of the 60s toward a more, how shall I say it, uh, depending on your political point of view. The Democratic Party either moves toward the center, or if you, again, depending on your point of view, moves to the right. I'll let you decide what view you want to take uh, in that regard. Most importantly, 1986, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, where 55% of the people that apply for legalization will be in one state, California, and where 45% of the people that achieve legalization five years later, given the provisions of the Immigration Reform and Control Act, will be in one state. California. Because of our immigration laws, under the provision of family reunification, then many people who had been here unauthorized, once they receive legal status, bring over their immediate relatives. And that bloats, if you will, the demographic consequences of the legalization of that population by 1991, 1992, given that five-year provision of the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act. The 1980s, from roughly 1982 to about uh, 1987, um, or if you want, 88, are the golden years of Reagan, 
uh, Reaganism here in the United States. That's when the economy booms, especially in California. No coincidence. He was the ex-governor of California. Uh, and it makes for a tremendous expansion of the opportunity structure, particularly among or within the low-wage labor market, making it even easier for immigrants coming from Mexico, not only to go to the traditional jobs like agriculture, but very importantly, a, a big move of many of these immigrants into non-agricultural work. As some of you may know, no more than 6% of the Latino workforce now works in agriculture. Now here in the Central Valley, of course, it's much higher. But statewide, 94 percent, 95, 94, maybe 93 now with the recession still working itself out uh, and so on, of Latinos work in the non-agricultural labor force. So the 1980s then is a tectonic plate shift from the historical pattern of the past. Uh, and again, if you like, we can discuss um, more specifically the, the 20s. Uh, the 40s, the Depression, of course, makes for the pause button. In the 40s and the 50s, the Bracero program and its implications. Uh, the 1960s, where there's a gradual rise in migration. Then comes the 80s, and you see the big rise. So let me very quickly go through these slides. I don't want to spend a lot of time on them. Uh, you'll forgive me by going very fast, but you'll get the story, right? If you look at the increase of Latinos, uh, in Stanislaus County, 15%. Uh, it's now up to about 42, 43%. The foreign born is a sizable proportion uh, of that group, largely due to the migration that came in the 80s and the subsequent uh, arrival of family relatives. Uh, so you can see the picture, and a lot of my friends from Southern California especially love to show these slides. Look at us, we're increasing numbers, uh, and so on. Um, the difference between native born and foreign born. And I want to emphasize how wrong this pie chart is because it leaves out what I call the 1.5 generation. That is that generation of young people who come over in a manner of speaking literally in the bellies, if you will, of their parents, but they're born on this side of the border. So even though they're native born, to a large extent, they reflect their formative social, cultural identity, and so on, within the context of a very Mexican environment. I grew up muy mexicano. No más hablaba español. I got to kindergarten, and I only spoke Spanish. And thank God for Mrs. Muller in the third grade, because up until that time, I never spoke, because I was afraid of saying the wrong thing, mispronouncing words, uh, and so on. Uh, I also stuttered, probably because I was nervous. But the important point is, that these numbers misrepresent, and I'll continue with that theme in just a second. This is Merced County. Again, very similar figures. This is Merced County. We continue growing from the 1980s. You can see the, the reference point. Again, like most of the counties of the, San of the central San Joaquin Valley, about a third are foreign born. But notice again, we don't have the 1.5 generation uh, as some demographers call it. This is Madera County, my county. Uh, this is what's happening to Madera. Uh, again, about a third of the population. This is Fresno County. This is the growth rate. Again, about a third, 30%. Tulare County, very similar story. And then I'll go through some of the cities if you like. The important point is there's a basic misrepresentation taking place with these, with these figures. And I want to break that down in two layers. One layer is the ways in which these figures need to be problematized, need to be complicated, uh, if you will. First, generational difference. In the Central Valley, we have people whose roots go back to that early phase. Most of them now have passed away. Most of the elderly who are Latino here in Modesto or whether it's in Merced or whether it's in Fresno or Bakersfield, uh, 
the, the age of my parents, my uncles and so on, they're in their 70s and their 80s. Some have made it all the way into the early 90s uh, and so on. And then we have my generation, the children of the children who came in that early part of the 20th century, uh, if you will. That's what I mean by the maturation of the Mexican-American generation, who now, in my case, have my children, most of whom are English dominant, do not speak Spanish. Many of them have to learn Spanish at Modesto City College and Spanish classes and the like and this sort of thing, except my daughter. All right, I took her to Mexico on purpose. Uh, I did an exchange and stayed there for a couple of years that you will learn Spanish. Unfortunately, she came back speaking like a chilanga, all right, from Mexico City. But that's another story. And if you want, we can talk about vernacular Spanish versus academic Spanish and so on. The important point is this, is that there is misrepresentation when we lump Latinos together that misses the generational differences that are taking place on a variety of different cultural planes. Uh, if you will. Uh, second, the immigration uh, surge of the 1980s is distinctive not only for all the reasons that I just mentioned, but because of the schism, the fissure, the rift, the fracturing that takes place between those immigrants and Mexican Americans, where Mexican Americans either implicitly, and I do have to say sometimes very explicitly, disassociate themselves from the immigrant population coming in in the same way that many Germanic Jews disassociated themselves from the southern and eastern European Jews they were coming into New York and so on those of you who read that wonderful book by Irving Howe um, uh, the home of our fathers of thy fathers and so on depicts that and that's not unusual not when you have gradations of status over time that change within the same ethnic group. Or my favorite soprano program is when they go to Italy and they think they're Italians and the Italians make it very clear that they're no longer Italian. All right. But the important point is the immigration surge and the schism, the tension, the fissures uh, that take place and I'll talk about that uh, in terms of culture in a few minutes.